The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to BS Report. It's a sunny day here in Southern California. Not as sunny in Miami. Maybe it is sunny. I don't know what's going on. On the phone line right now, the host of Highly Questionable on ESPN2. The host of A Drive Time Show in Miami that I go on every once in a while that I don't even know what the name is. I guess it's the Dan Levitard show, but, uh, and then, uh, I don't know what else you're doing, but Dan Levitard, he's on the phone right now. What's happening? Um, it's pretty apocalyptic here, Bill. Everybody is, uh, you know, terrified. This team is, uh, mocked throughout, uh, the country. Uh, you know, it brings joy every time they lose or out it. So now, you know, the Miami Heat fan is really scared. That Miami Heat team has to feel pretty lonely because the fan base has post-traumatic stress disorder from last year, and uh, it's just really distrustful of this team right now. Did you go last night? I did. Okay. Um, this isn't – I'm not trying to start trouble and talk about how bad certain fan bases are against other fan bases. Um, the crowd was dead, and it actually reminded me a lot of the Cleveland crowd – two years ago i don't think it was a case of we're bad fans we don't have you know we we don't know what to do it was more a case of we're absolutely terrified we don't trust this team and we're crapping our pants was that is that a fair assessment of the crowd i think that yeah i think most crowds get like that i'm guessing that if we go to san antonio and san antonio game five is realizing that the young thunder aren't afraid of them um i'm guessing they could feel uh, a similar fear um and given what happened to this team last year, maybe you wouldn't have felt it if last year hadn't happened. But given that they rolled through the playoffs last year, and then all of a sudden it was over as fast as it was, game six of the finals felt like what last night felt like, where you just you could feel the fear in the building. And then it ceases to be a home court advantage. Once you feel that, the players are on their own. It ceases to be a home court advantage. In fact, it's a little bit of a detriment because you can't get anything going. And you feel, um, you know, the weight of every missed free throw. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, you know, we thought they spent money on Haslam. They spent money on Mike Miller. They spent money on Battier. Chalmers hasn't been terrible in the playoffs. But, you know, they still don't have that guy who – and usually it's a point guard. Just that guy who's like, all right, guys, settle down. I got this and makes a play. Like even I was thinking about – Steve Nash, like he's a free agent this summer. Like you put Steve Nash in that game last night, and I feel like that whole team falls into place. It just seems like it's too easy for them to get knocked out of whatever they like to do, and then it's just these five guys standing around that yeah, I don't sense a flow. I also don't sense a lot of chemistry. You know, I know these guys like each other. I don't think it's a case of these guys are feuding behind the scenes or anything, but uh, you just don't – sense the chemistry that like a team like the Celtics have. Do you think that's fair? Well, what I think is that when something happens that's a little bit inexplicable, you go searching for reasons for why it is that it happened. And when you get beaten at home with Rondo going two for nine and Ray, uh, Ray Allen going two for nine, Rondo three for 15 and, and Pierce going six for 19, it's confusing. So all of that stuff is in play because you're looking for explanations for what it is that happened. But I don't think the problems for all the coaching criticism they're getting today and predictable they are in offense, scored 30 points in the fourth quarter. That's yeah. usually what beat the Celtics. What I've been stunned by in this series is not offensive issues. It's that a team as limited offensively as Boston against Philadelphia and Atlanta is doing bigger, better things against what is by all, by consensus, a better defense. Miami defense is better than Atlanta and Philadelphia. So, right. you know, all that criticism is in play once you lose. I would say the biggest factor from that end is that Ray Allen has been a different guy in this series than he was in the first two. I don't think he's back to being the old Ray Allen, but he's gone from being somebody who was a legitimate liability and somebody who couldn't move to somebody who's doing a really passable Ray Allen impression. And for, 
you know, for whatever reason, this Celtics team has a ton of confidence against Miami. And I don't know whether that it's partly a LeBron James thing or whether they just don't think Miami is well coached or whether they just love this particular matchup for them. But, man, you know, I went on your show after game two. I thought they should have won game two and, and, and came damn close anyway. They didn't really have any luck with the officiating that game. But it, they've played the last four games like a team that honestly believed they were going to win, which is kind of half the battle when you're going against a juggernaut like Miami. And, and you know, you followed the Miami team more closely than I have. When Dallas kind of got to that same point too, what is it about the makeup of this Miami team that they seem to be different when they're up 10 versus when it's a close game in the last couple of minutes and the other team is staring at them going, yeah, we're going to be right here. We're not going away. You're going to have to beat us. Well, don't you think that Boston's that way with every team they ever play? Like, I don't think Boston, that, that those resumes, I don't think that they're ever going to be afraid of anybody. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, usually Miami, for all the glamour and for all the fame and, and, People love offense and love highlight plays and spectacular plays. Miami's offense is not how they identify themselves. The way Miami identifies itself is defense. And the Celtics have put up a ton of 30-point quarters in this series, which yep. doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I'm sitting there watching it, and I don't understand it. If you told me, if you told me in the middle of that game, 42-40 at halftime, if you told me the Heat are going to put up 30 in the fourth quarter, and the Celtics are going to match them, uh, th- match the defense. Because you remember you remember the end of game four after the Celtics put up 61 in the first half. Do you remember how hard it became to score for the Celtics in the fourth yeah. quarter of the game? Um, yeah. That's what I expect at the end of games from Miami. That's how they got to the championship last year. And, the, the, you know, the Celtics through the last four games have, uh, have cracked that. So – Let's say the Celtics win game six, certainly a possibility. They're home. Um, what happens to this Miami team? Like, I, I don't want to – I hate doing the hyperbole thing, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing the hyperbole thing from time to time. I feel like this is the biggest conference finals game in 14 years since Pacers-Bulls 1998, just in terms of, like, the historical ramifications of it. Like, that Jordan – that was Jordan's like last great team. He was he was obviously going to retire. He was leaning toward retiring at the end of that year. He's got this Indiana team that's just fighting back tooth and nail that entire series. And it got to a point where it was like, wow, this could be Jordan's last stand. He might lose the title here. I watched this Miami team, and I think, wow, if if they lose this game six, or even worse, if they get killed in this game six, like – it feels like the historical axis of the league is going to change a little bit. And that's before you get, you throw in all the Boston subplots of Rondo and KG and Pierce and Ray Allen and Doc Rivers. Um, I mean, do you feel like that sense of, of history that's here in this game? Well, with this team, I have felt since it started. I mean, every time they lose, everyone's getting traded and everyone's getting fired. Like, the expectations with this team and what the noise that surrounds this team is unlike anything I've ever covered in sports. So it's hard to read through the distortion and see what they feel on the inside, given all that you have on the outside. So I have no idea what Pat Riley's reaction is going to be, whether he shrugs his shoulders and says, well, this only happened because Bosch wasn't healthy or, or, you know, whether he's reasonable and loyal or whether he blows the thing up because, He's impatient. I think it's really hard to see it from here. But when you talk about the history, um, the reason this feels here in Miami, just short-term history, this game feels they've only been in this situation one time, and they lost at home, terrified, in game six of the final. Dirk Nowitzki yep. called like one for 13 in the first half because the weight of this is so enormous. They've you know, you always have the cushion. Last night you're playing, and I don't think that he was scared last night. I don't think at the end of the game they were scared, but I do wonder if it comes down to the end of the next one where that's it. It ends. Um, I do wonder whether that would be a way that they're carrying around. But of course this is big, Bill. Like, I don't, you tell me, do you think, what does America want? Because I don't think America wants the Heat losing in this round. I think what America wants is the Heat losing in the next round. Losing to the Thunder so that the idea of it, you can spend the next series rooting against the Heat, and then also you can think, oh, 
oh, wait, that team's younger than the Heat. The Heat's window just closed. It's an interesting question. They, it seems like people have a lot of different agendas with this series, just from people I talk to, people in my life, emails I'm getting from readers, things like that. Some people just love when Miami loses, and they're going to root for whoever's playing them, and that's it. Some people have gotten attached to the Celtics thing and you know the old team, the crusty old guard getting together one last time. It's a fun storyline. Um, other people just hate Boston and want Boston to lose. Um, other people feel like what you just said, like, oh, this would ruin what would be an awesome – Miami Oklahoma City finals. I've already watched these Celtics guys a bunch of time. I want to see LeBron play Durant. And you know, and then there's other people that I'm sure that are out there like, "Man, wouldn't it be great if Miami just totally imploded here?" You know, and the, and it, this was the end of this two summers ago. They do the decision and the heat welcome party all that stuff and then 23 months later, it it basically just completely self-combusts one last time here in the Boston Garden. Um, I think people would sign up for that. I, you know, I look at the Miami team and I still keep coming back to Wade because Wade, time and time again, LeBron can, even though LeBron's been great in this series, um, he, he'll still, you can see him checking out a little bit or getting tentative in certain points, especially in big moments. And Wade was always the guy who's just had that fearlessness to him. Like in game two, he was the guy that stared down KG. What do you think he's healthy? Because I feel like he's not 100 percent healthy. No, I don't think he's healthy. He doesn't have the normal explosion that he has. But I mean, uh, is Pierce healthy? No. I mean, who who the hell's healthy at this point? I mean, Karan Butler was running around out there with a broken hand. I mean, like I don't. Yeah, I don't think he's healthy. And I mean, these are some of the worst halves of basketball that any of us have ever seen from him. Uh, and he played the single worst basketball game in game three against the Pacers that I have ever seen a superstar play in a big spot where yep. he, he was dribbling the ball off his foot, stepping out of bounds and scored doesn't score five points in that spot on two of 13 shooting. So, um, yeah, no, he's not right. And his, and his jump shot is broken. Uh, so I yeah, don't, I don't... That, it was interesting when he passed up that three dribbled in and then almost passed up the two and then like begrudgingly took it and made it with like about four minutes to go. You remember how often he killed Dallas with because he was kind of Russell Westbrook with accuracy, where you simply couldn't stop the jump. He was going to go get his jump shot in the middle of the in the middle of the paint. He was going to yep. get it whenever he wanted to. And he was going to hit it. He does. I mean, it's broken. He's uh, he's shooting like that. A lot of people were telling me they liked the shot at the end of the game uh, in Game Four against the Celtics because it's an open look to finish the game. You don't go into double overtime and you got clutch guy taking it in Dwayne Wade. But he's the 27 percent shooter from three this year. Like that, that wasn't a good shot. I mean, I know it looked like a good shot, but he doesn't make that shot a lot. And also, you know, hasn't been shooting even the two point shot that well this series. It, the thing that I thought was fascinating about last night's game, other than the fact that the crowd just seemed to almost infect the Heat players, like it just seems some everybody was just panicked. Um, the Celtics played pretty poorly for three quarters there, and. Uh, and it's just like Miami kept letting him hang around and hang around. I'm sending emails and I'm sending texts to my Boston friends saying like, man, they're dying for us to take this game. They're just dying for it and we just can't make a shot. Then finally the Celtics started playing better. And what's interesting is if you watch the last five minutes of the game, Miami played pretty well. Like they got good shots. I Boston just was lights out in the last five minutes. Like when was the last time you remember somebody blocking – LeBron shot at the rim like KG did with three minutes left. I can't remember the last time KG did that. You know, that was one of the big swings of the game. Boston got to the loose balls. They made threes. They made all their free throws. Like, they played that last five games about as, uh, last five minutes about as well as a team can play, I felt like. Well, they clo- yeah, they closed it out. Like, didn't miss a free throw. The Heat have been missing free throws throughout. I tell you, though, I do wonder about this. Uh, when we talk about pressure and we talk about the Stakes, and we talk about this Boston team is already really overachieved. I mean, if they were to lose in seven to the Heat, while it'd be disappointing, um, I mean, there would be no shame in it for the Boston fans. I do wonder about this. The shot that Pierce took in that spot with a minute left or less than a minute left in LeBron's face, up one, not, not a good shot, even though he makes it. It's not a high percentage shot, especially with LeBron on you. I wonder if the situation is reversed in game six, where whether anybody on the Heat, given the consequences in the stakes, would have the balls to take that shot because 
of everything that hangs over them that doesn't hang over Paul Pierce. And I know Paul Pierce has been making that shot for, for the entirety of his career, but can you imagine anybody on the Heat, given what's at stake, doing that with 50 seconds left? Yeah, I would say Wade would be the only one to do it. You know, it's funny you mentioned Balls. I, a friend of mine was sitting behind Boston's bench. He said you could see Pierce talking after he made it. He was saying, I have the balls to take that shot. That's what he was saying. And I think it's kind of like it's, you know, the athletes have to pump themselves up, but it seemed like it was more of a dig at the Miami guys. Like he was saying those guys didn't have the balls to take that shot. I don't know, but that's what he was muttering to himself. And the funny thing about it was I wrote about this today on our blog. Uh, I thought it was going in. And he was 5 for 18 at that point and could have hit the side of a barn. But when he took that specific shot, I was like, oh, that's going to go in. We're going to be up four. And well, then it went in. Are, that's where you are with the Celtics, and that's where fans are with the Celtics. Because you've seen them do it, yep. um, you trust them. And because Heat fans haven't seen them do it, and quite the opposite, last year saw them not do it. Um, yeah, I don't think there's that kind of faith um, in this team. And I don't know whether that's something that, you know, we hate. Uh, a, a Dwayne Wade or a LeBron James, um, so that it would affect it would affect how they play. I don't think it would affect a Dwayne Wade, but I guess everybody would say it would affect LeBron. So you think Spolster's definitely the Fredo here, right? If they lose, well, you know what's funny about this, Bill? Like Spolster's just getting savaged all over the place. That he's getting out coached by Doc Rivers, and that and that may indeed be so. Um, but. I'm sitting here looking, and last year, Eric Spolstra beat Boston in five, and the difference, I don't think, is that Eric Spolstra outcoached Doc last year and isn't able to outcoach him this year. I think the difference is that last year he had Bosch, and after two games, Doc didn't have a healthy Rondo. And so now, Miami doesn't have Bosch, and Boston does have a healthy Rondo, and all of a sudden, you go from a five-game series last year where one of the games was decided in overtime and could have been 2-2 if Boston doesn't lose game four in overtime. You have the same series here, um, and people are talking about this guy's out coaching that guy, and to me it's just, uh, I mean, the teams are a lot closer, um, they're, they're a lot closer to being peers and equals than, uh, than any of us thought. You know how this stuff works, though. You can pass a point with a coach when, once there's blood in the water, it's kind of over, and I feel like Spolster's at that point. Because even if he comes back let's, next year, let's say they start out 11 and 7, then it all starts to get, like, you almost can't come back past a certain point. And also, maybe they do need a better coach. Maybe, you know, I know Phil Jackson and Pat Riley hate each other. I know this rumor's been around. At the same time, it does seem like this is the logical place for Phil Jackson to end his career, running the triangle with Bosch, LeBron, and Wade. And, and, you know, now he's with three generations of the, uh, the, you know, the, the most polarizing and best superstars that the league's had. It seems like that's the logical conclusion. Is there any chance Phil Jackson would be involved there? I, I, I can't imagine him and Riley would bury the hatchet, but I'm, what do you think? I don't, I don't think that's a possibility. I don't think, I mean, Riley runs this organization and likes having his own people. And that guy I would think would be last on the list. I think you're more likely to see, this is how unlikely I think that is. I think you're more likely to see, to look up at your television today and see on the ESPN scroll, uh, Brian Windhorst reporting that Pat Riley is going to coach game six. Ooh, I was wondering if he would maybe do that. In a sports <laughs> movie, like, in a sports movie, movie he did that. Week. Come on, let's do that. Like, how? That, that's the only way this thing could get more fun is if all of a sudden just coming down, you know, all of a sudden before, before game six, it's announced that... Uh, Riley will take it from here. By the way, as a Celtics fan, that scenario would terrify me. I thought you were going to say that Windhorse was going to get hired to coach the, coach the Heat, and I was thinking, like, ah, not a bad idea. Like, he knows this Heat team pretty well. So he can maybe <laughs> can reach LeBron. Yeah. I think he can do some good things. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, they're so down on Spo here right now. I mean, but they're, yeah. I just think that's what happens whenever you, you can't explain. Like, I think it's real hard to explain in tangible terms what it is that you witnessed last night. And what I, the place that I would go with that is I would say that, you know, Boston was 27th in the league in free throws uh, taken, and Miami was second. Boston took more yesterday, and it's not because the referees. It's because Miami took 26 threes in the game. They were playing yep. a docile, soft game. They tilt all the game's odds in their favors because they get so many free throws. And they just decided to play a totally different game yesterday at a really bad time. 
On Grantland today, Malcolm Gladwell and I exchanged, uh, we, we spent the last two days exchanging emails. And one of the topics, I don't want to give too much away, but one of the topics was about what it's like to be LeBron James in 2012 in the digital age. And the fact that, you know, he's, he's a brand. He's managing that brand because that's what you have to do 24 seven. You're on Twitter. You're, you know, you're constantly worried about how you're being perceived. Um, could that, the fact that you're always conscious of what people are thinking of you and you're listening and it's not like one of those things where you're tuning it out and you're saying, ah, I'm going to block those guys out. He can't because he's managing his brand. Could that be part of the reason why it almost seems like he gets overcome in some of these moments in these games? And I don't know. I enjoy uh, psychoanalyzing him and wondering whether or not he's got some sort of short circuit in the hard wiring that would make him unlike any great player ever. And, you know, the narrative a lot of times is that that kind of guy, the assassin guy, has to have some <laughs> you in him. Right. Uh, and, and that he doesn't seem to have very much of that in him. But I, I just think that at the moment he's got to feel – criticism or no criticism he's just got to feel so alone bill because i mean oh. have you seen what happens to the miami heat i mean this team has Dwayne wade on it when he leaves the game for a minute and a half like he leaves the game for a minute and a half and leads evaporate and mario chalmers is throwing the ball off the shot clock and, right. and they don't look like they know what they're doing and the defense just completely short circuits and I mean, he's got to have huge, huge confidence in his skills, but I don't see how right now he can look around him and and feel uh, anything other than really alone. Well, and that goes back to the coaching thing because Spo did him a disservice last year and he did it again this year. I just think he plays too many minutes. And when you look at the two-way responsibility he has for for Miami and just how much he means to that team – no, nobody can play 45 minutes a game in the playoffs. He, the only guy who could do it was Allen Iverson, who flamed out so quickly and so fast that, you know, he was begging for a job in the second round of the playoffs to the sideline reporter. I just think it's not fair to LeBron. You know, it, that, that's where a coach just say, and this is something that Doc did with Doc, with Kevin Garnett. You know, he's, he knows what, what Kevin Garnett's minutes should be. He never wavers from those minutes. Like he even had him out. I forget if it was game four or game five. Yeah, it was five minutes left in the game and he had him out because KG had played too many minutes because of foul trouble. And, you know, I think the combination of the minutes and the pressure and the fact that, you know, these guys, Doug, put the, let's be honest, put themselves in a corner in the summer of 2010 with some of the boasting. And that's oh, a, that's the one thing you can't do as as an athlete. Keep faking that out, though. Like I've I've thought that the way that this is going to end up is that we're going to find ourselves in a situation, game six or game seven, at the very end, where LeBron James exhausted. He's exhausted because of all the minutes, and at the very end of a game, he's going to have one of two options. Um, he's not going to be able to take the jump shot. And Michael Jordan won all his games on jump shots. They weren't one at the rim. He's not going to be able to take the jump shot because his legs are going to be dead. And he's just, I mean, it's just not the most prudent shot. He can't get to the rim. So those aren't good options. Or he gets fouled. And now with all of that at the end of a game, he's not a good free throw shooter. Like he's okay. Yep. He's not a consistent free throw shooter. So now add the fatigue on top of that. Like I, I like down the line, I've seen maybe it ends faster than that. Down the line, though, and I've seen some sort of disaster scenario where the fatigue just grabs him right at the end, and then he has to live with another offseason of what mental frailty. Imagine that. Imagine taking free throws after you've played 45 minutes, defended all five of the positions, yeah. uh, and you're, you're just okay at free throws. You're not consistent with your free throws. Yeah, I just want to say, I think he's been incredible in these playoffs. I To me, this is like... If, if you're going to say like 50 years from now, what kind of player was LeBron James like? Like just watch some of the – the fact that he's guarded all five positions, it, there's only been one other guy in the history of the league who can do that, Magic Johnson. And by the way, Magic Johnson wasn't a good defensive player. This is right. the only <laughs> guy who – this is the only guy who – yeah, he's the only guy who could guard Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Rajon Rondo really well in the same game. 
you know, and that's before you get to the fact that he's averaging 30 points, eight assists, and nine rebounds, or whatever his numbers are. You know, I just think, I don't think he should be the scapegoat for what's happening here. If anything, I think the scapegoat should be the mentality that you can win with three guys and that it, a supporting cast doesn't matter. And this is something we argued about on your radio show for two solid years. You, have you changed your opinion on that? I mean, you see the value of an eight-man team now, right? Well, no, this is where I have changed my opinion, and it has been changed by a representative two-year sample size on this Heat team uh, that has forced me uh, because this team is not as good as I thought it was uh, and or I expected it to be, and this has all been a lot harder than I thought it was. Um, I don't think it's eight players. I think your three players have to fit better than this, that Boston won the championship the first year with three lesser talents in Ray Allen, Garnett, and Paul Pierce, and won it their first year. Had the labor to do it through the playoffs, but won 66 games that first year, the second most in that franchise's history, and came out of the box without needing to congeal because the pieces fit. Like, And I think that these guys, can, the talent here is so overwhelming that you can overcome, and they did last year overcome pieces fitting better in Boston and in Chicago. But sometimes... In a seven-game series, the talent isn't going to be able to do that to the team. And and so it's, it's, it's not unsimilar to the concern I have with Oklahoma City. Those pieces don't fit perfectly either. You'll file that under supporting cast. But here, you've got two guys who do the identical thing. And that wasn't the case with Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and, and Kevin Garnett. So I've had to lend more credence to the idea that it, it, it can't just be talent. You can't overcome a team just with overwhelming talent. They were two games from doing that last year, um, but that's where I think I, I've had to change my mind. Can I say something? Yes. That's what I was telling you two summers ago. <laughs> you were telling me that Eddie House was important. He was. That the eighth guy is important. It is. Oh, come on. Who hit the biggest shot of yesterday's game? Michael Petrus. Yes, Michael Petras did, but who's, who usually hits the big shot? It's a, who is, what, what, you're talking about James Harden hitting the shot at the end, or Paul Pierce hitting the shot at the end. Like, no, but me. they, the Oklahoma City won game four because Abaca and Perkins went 18 for 20. And San Antonio played really well in that game, and Abaca and Perkins kept them in it, and then Durant just did his thing at the end. But you know, going back to the, the double guy who does the same thing, I thought that was the most interesting thing of this Oklahoma City series. We'll see if it continues, but there was a very similar alpha dog issue with Westbrook and Durant with the LeBron Wade, like, oh, is it my turn? Is it your turn? Durant kind of not only proved that it was his turn and that it's his team, but Westbrook, that was one of his best games in game four. He actually like accepted the fact that this was Durant's team, and he stayed out of the way, and he let Durant do his thing. I with Miami, it's just it's too weird. Like sometimes Wade will take over, but there's LeBron James, who's one of the most ten talented players who's ever played, just standing in the corner. It makes no sense. It's an illogically put together team, and if they can win the title despite that, it, yeah, I'll be surprised. I personally think they need, you know, I think Nash or somebody like him would be the answer. I just think you need a point guard who can decide, all right, you're getting the ball here. You're getting, you know, like the way Rondo directs the Celtics. Go over there. This guy's shooting here. We're going to do this this time. Maybe that's what they need. But you've got two guys who create all the offense off the dribble. Like, those are, I mean, those are two guys. You're talking about, first of all, Westbrook has taken more shots this postseason than Durant has. And, True. And LeBron has taken a lot more shots this postseason than Wade has. I mean, Wade gave the team over to LeBron. Like, Wade says by his own words, um, I had to step back. This is the best player in the world. I saw that we were a lot more efficient with him. I'm trying to fit my game around what he's doing now. I mean, if we had this conversation three games ago, uh, we would have been talking about how they figured that part out. If we'd been having this conversation three games ago, we'd been talking about how Oklahoma City hadn't figured that out. Um, but well, that's why that's why I went on your radio show after Game Two, and I was so upset when they lost. It, that was the most upset I've been after a loss, and it wasn't just the officiating. I really felt like this Miami team could be had, and the Celtics missed their chance in that game because I felt like, all right, 
the Celtics are as good as Miami. Like, they can win this series, but it's too hard to win five games to two. Like, once you have a game where you really you should have won it and you didn't, it's it's just mentally the in the NBA that seems like too big of a thing, which is why I was just I, I just can't believe they've won three in a row. I just assumed really? one of these three games. I, I don't think momentum carries over from game to game. I mean, Maybe it doesn't. Uh, because you guys, I mean, game three, Boston, like that was a crushing defeat for Boston. Uh, game two and yep. game three, they were overwhelming. That's the best game. You know, that's the best game they played in the series. Well, I, I didn't mean that. You know, it was going to discourage them from thinking they had a chance. It was more like a law of averages. Like, if you if you go into it thinking, all right, they should have won game two, then basically you're saying, all right, now they basically have to win four and a half out of the seven games against a team that has the two best players in the series. You still, have, the you still have the dirty pants. Uh, I still have the what? The dirty pants. What are the dirty? What's that? Mar, uh, Marcin Gortat uh, said that when he got his nose broken. Um, they they tried to readjust it and realign it, and it hurt so much that he was describing it as "I almost got the dirty pants." And the entire <laughs> Heat fan base, the entire Heat fan base right now, has the dirty pants. But it sounds like you're not totally confident in uh, in Game Six that you're remembering that Atlanta beat Boston there, that Philadelphia beat Boston there, um, and that Miami was a bounce, you know, was a shot for beating Boston there the other day. I I, I thought you'd be cockier today. I thought you'd be more confident. Yeah. Well, first of all, the team's old. Uh, it's my favorite Celtics team in 25 years. They, I, the crowd is going to show up and be incredible. I know that much. I know that the Celtics team, ha, you know, in the past has been able to close things out at home when they've had the chance. Um, but it's still a game where the other team has the two best players on the floor. And we can say, yeah, Boston plays better and that's usually going to prevail. But, I mean, you're telling me it's not conceivable that LeBron could go for like a 45, 15, 16? Well, he could. He could. But see, when you say two best players on the floor, Wade in this series has not been the second best player on the floor. It, that's uh, true. It's true. Garnett has been. And, well, and even Rondo. I mean, Wade's probably been fourth. I, I yeah. would say KG and Rondo have been 2-3. Oh, but, I mean, yeah, but, but can Wade do what he did in game six uh, at Indiana where he went 17 for 25? Can he do that again? I don't know. I mean, they do have two guys. They are the the only team in this series that has two guys that could go for forty and ten. Right. And then the other thing is the the other thing that scares me about Miami, just from a game to game basis, is they have the enough three point shooters who can get hot that they can have one of those games where they go like fifteen for twenty five from three. And that's why in game one I was so nervous. I said this to you on your show, like, you know, Miami won by ten and their and their three point shooters went five for twenty five from three. You just figured law of averages, so that's not happening again. Well, that happened again last night. Hey, it hey. happened again last night. And, uh, you know, I, I do think for Miami to win, I don't think they're going to get the 40-point game from Wade. I just think physically he's 65%. And I don't think LeBron – it's just not in him to drop – I guess he did it against Indiana in game four, but this is not Indiana. You know, it's just going to be too hard for him to break 40, I feel like. He, he would have to be – one of the three best games he's ever played. Um, but the way that they can get into this is if they can start making some threes and putting, you know, kind of opening it up, open up the floor. And, and they need their supporting guys in this game um, more than they've ever had. You know, I thought they lost to Dallas because of LeBron and to a lesser degree Wade and Bosch. But this is a series where their supporting guys just need to step up for them. And I don't know if they're good enough. LeBron is two for six in this kind of elimination game. But you remember one of them, probably. I mean, he did do it against this Boston team. He did it against this Boston team in 2008. He went 45-5-6, and six, but they lost. Yeah, well, they, and, that, and that's, you know, this is, goes back to the, the discussion about what's changed about him that Gladwell and I were having. in 07 comes through against Detroit. Game five, epic performance. One of the best ever. Um 2008, shows up for Game 7, plays a fantastic game, and if Delonte West hits a three, they 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 probably win that game. Delonte missed a three with like two minutes left, and if it goes in, I think Cleveland would have been up by three or four. Um, and then 2009, he was superhuman in that, in that entire playoffs, and especially in the Orlando series. I mean, he was a one-man team and almost beat Orlando by himself. Orlando was playing well. But we haven't seen that guy really on a consistent basis for three years. And, 
You know, man, I, I just think this is an incredible game. You're not going, are you? You can't. You're doing TV. Yeah, I can't go. Um, yeah, it's a crazy, it's a crazy game. Like I, I have no idea what to expect in that game because Miami's favored to win. Miami, you know, Dwayne Wade hits a shot in the last game uh, at Boston. They feel like they can win there. I would assume, given that it was a shot that they came from winning after allowing 61 points in the first half. They've seen. Atlanta and Philadelphia win in Boston. Um, I just the, the the thing that would prevent me from thinking that they could win this game. The only thing is that they just collapse under the weight of it. They could win if they just play the way they normally play, but the weight for this game is going to be unlike anything that they've felt. They've only felt it one other time, and it was Game Six of the Finals last year when they collapsed under it. Yeah, and. This Boston crowd is going to be tremendous. Yeah, that was at home. Yeah, that was at home. Yeah, this Boston crowd. There's certain crowds you just don't want to see in this specific type of situation. Boston, the Boston fans are going to be really loud, and if they smell blood in the water, they're going to go for it. And it, you know, I guess the the best case scenario for the Celtics would be Game Six against the Lakers in 2008, which was just could smell it from the get-go, went after it, took a lead, crowd took over, guys went to another level, people are making threes. Like That's your best-case scenario. I don't think this Celtics team is as good as that 08 team, but they play better together. And uh, it's going to be fascinating. Man, this is fun, though. I mean, we were, we were saying uh, – what were we saying after game one on your show? I was like, man, I just – I love this series. Like, it's just – this is a great rivalry. I'm so glad that – you know, but there's been some bitterness back and forth with the Miami fans, the Boston fans, all that stuff. But ultimately, this is a, this is just fantastic. Like, this is a rivalry that I feel like I, KG's coming back. The Celtics are going to be there next year. They're going to bring back Jeff Green. I think they're going to they're going to uh, have uh, Chris Wilcox back. They're going to have Bradley's healthy. The two draft picks, like they're going to be around next year, and we get to keep doing this. So that's my favorite part of this whole thing. I asked uh, fans the other day here if they were having fun, and the answer was no answer was no because it's not fun to lose uh so i yes i would say it's great fun the whole thing. i yeah i could see that part i'm just in general as sports fans this is great theater like this is why we do this i feel like you know this is why we do you churn out crappy columns in february and you grind your way through some tv show where you don't even have one interesting topic in march and this is <laughs> you, you, it's for weeks like this you know this is freaking theater it's great. Anyway, uh, thanks for coming on. Good luck on your uh, local radio show. So I had a Stu Gatz for me. All right, brother. Always a pleasure. I'll talk All to right. you soon. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Before we go, I wanted to bring in ESPN.com, NBA pages, new, uh, meal ticket. He writes like every day. I'm really jealous of his work ethic. I used to have it once upon a time. John Hollinger, what's happening? Not much. Really, really excited to swear a little. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, drop as many. You can go full KG on us if you want. Um, <laughs> Dan Lebetard and I just talked about um, a lot of the big picture storylines of the Miami-Boston series and a little bit about Oklahoma City, San Antonio, and uh, trying to psychoanalyze some things, stuff like that. Give us, from a numbers perspective, is there any rhyme or reason what has happened to either of these series in the past three games? Uh. No, both both of them in a lot of ways defied what we would expect from everything we saw in the season. Uh, in the case of Miami-Boston, Boston is scoring far more easily than we had any reason to expect, and that's really been the story of that whole series. Uh, yeah. And then in the Oklahoma City series, Oklahoma City's role players are crushing San Antonio's, which is the complete opposite of how the whole season went uh, up till three games ago there, too. And you talk about Boston scoring more efficiently. The you love a stat. Zach Lowe loves it. A couple other people. The what is it? Uh, points per hundred possessions. Yes, yes. And, Bo- and Boston was way down. And for whatever One reason, in the regular yeah, season. And for whatever reason, that's jumped way up. And makes and it's illogical. I I have no explanation as a fan watching it. What do you have any explanation? Uh, I think Miami's transition defense has been poor, certainly, and Boston has an easier time scoring in transition than it does in the half court. I, th- I think that's definitely been a factor uh, because th- those opportunities weren't there for them as much against Atlanta and Philadelphia, and they had a hard time scoring in those two series, too. Their defense was just so dominant that they won anyway. 
But against Miami, I mean, we saw especially last night, you know, all these plays where Wade is just jogging back on defense. Uh, you know, that whole thing Rondo said at halftime of game four was, it wasn't a slap at Miami as much as it was the truth. That's exactly what's been happening. It, you know, Miami guy stands there with his arms up in the air looking at the ref, and then it's five on four the other way. And, and that's a situation Rondo is so good at taking advantage of. Yeah, they, it's Miami's a very entitled team, and that's why I, I kind of freaked out after game two and, and then eventually had to ban myself from Twitter <laughs> during these Celtic games because it, it's not just the fact that they are they were getting most of the calls, but that they felt like they should be getting all of them. And uh, and that was frustrating to watch, especially when, when your team's blowing a chance to tie the series. But I, I agree with you, the effort – on the Miami end, it is has not been what it was. But then part of me wonders, well, is that because LeBron has played 16 playoff games and is averaging, what, 43 minutes per game? And is yeah, that, and Wade's banged up and he's playing 40 minutes a game? Like, are these guys just wearing down? And you wonder if the Bosch injury is catching up to him that way. Uh, because yep. they played so well those, you know, those games against Indiana that they needed – uh, but there were, there was a price for that, I think, and, and we may be seeing that now. Uh, so, you know, maybe Bosch comes back to the rescue tonight and, and everything's okay, but they put themselves in a real hole. Yeah, and you're also seeing the price of building your team around three guys, basically. And well, and, all of your money that way. You see, I don't think it's just that, though. They make bad decisions, too. I mean, they yep. use two full metal, mid-level exceptions and ended up with Mike Miller and Udonis Haslam. Yep. And they also spent real money on Joel Anthony, Joel Anthony. And we didn't then like they that. used the mini and the mini mid level on, on Battier. And I think if you look at like if you look at like what San Antonio did for instance, they didn't spend any more money than Miami did and they ended up with a lot better players. Uh and uh, the Heat I think were very focused on getting like these sort of thirty four year old veteran grinders and so even though they have LeBron and Wade, they kind of have this really unathletic team around them, and, and the pieces don't quite fit. Yeah, they made they made a couple classic mistakes. I actually, the Haslam contract I was okay with because he took such a discount. I think he would have gotten more in the open market. Miller was somebody that just got hurt all the time. You yeah, know? in retrospect, and, they, they should have signed Kyle Korver. I mean, that that was the play. Or, uh, which or how about this? Less money. You don't have to do anything. Just go into the season and try to, you know, play some games. This is what you and I similarly are driven crazy by GMs. They're, sometimes teams get in this mindset where they have to build their team. The team they have to build the team that they're going to have the following June in August, and they have to get every. And we we see year after year that's not that's not how the league works. Like guys are going to become available from December to February that you don't know are going to become available. You have buyout guys year after year. Like, look at Boris Diaw this year. San Antonio couldn't have planned for that. Um, the worst thing you can do is tie up your cap with role players, especially guys like Miller who, you know, don't play all the time. I didn't like that signing when it happened. I think people seem to be more surprised with uh, how bad he has played than maybe, you know, some of the people that were pretty watching these games pretty closely. I thought bad had been slipping the last couple of years. Didn't you feel that way too? Oh, totally. And you could see it. I mean, his plus minus numbers were when Houston was really at their peak with, you know, Yao and T-Mac. Battier had these crazy plus minus numbers. He, he just doesn't have those anymore. He's still, he's still effective within his little role, but he can't go outside that box at all. Yeah. And he, he's somebody that could, I think he'd be a really valuable eighth or ninth guy. But if you're, if you're trying to roll with him as the fourth piece on your team, I don't, I don't know if he's that kind of player anymore. And, you know, looking back, I know maybe it was part of the package, but was it a great idea to spend $18 million a year on Chris Bosh? Could they have been better off maybe splitting that money up? I forget who was available last summer, but you get LeBron and Wade and then try to get a couple $9 million guys versus one bigger guy. I don't know, but it certainly seems like they're better fits. There's been some buzz about a Bosh Gasol trade maybe this summer. Um, do you, you don't think they'd blow this up if they lost, do you? Well, it's interesting because I think they would feel a little bit like they never had their big three uh, in this series. So you uh, you you could defend keeping it get together more than if if Bosch had played the whole time and they were in this predicament. I think it would be easier to say, well, we got to do something here. Uh, 
Um, yeah. But in- injuries are a little something that's a little more beyond uh, their their control. Bosch Gasol is interesting to me because it gives them more of a pure post up guy, which Bosch really isn't, and and that would give them a very different look than they have right now. I would flip Bosch for Gasol, and I would I would on July first at midnight. I would be outside of Steve Nash's house, just begging him, please, we need you. You need to win a title. You're the only guy who can figure this really bizarre Wade LeBron thing out. Come on. Come win a title with us. Like that, They, it, it, if they lose, I feel like at the very least they have to change the coach and change some of the team. I don't think they have to do anything as drastic as Jade Bosch, but at least they have to sniff around. Let, let's talk about Oklahoma City, San Antonio for a second because – I haven't been as surprised by anything that's happened in the playoffs in a while. Um, I really thought San Antonio, maybe I jinxed them with the column I wrote. Um, I thought they were invincible. You were on it a little earlier than I was. You were writing, uh, even heading into the playoffs, like, hey, look at the, you guys got to watch out for this team. Um, Their demise, these last three games, it's inexplicable or explicable? Uh, it's hard to, it's hard to say anyone could have seen this coming. I mean, I, I thought, I mean, coming into the playoffs, I thought there was no way anyone was beating San Antonio. Obviously those first 10 games, which they won, only reinforced that impression to me. Uh, but, uh, Oklahoma City, this, like, I feel like something clicked with them. Like they, they are moving the ball in a way they never did the entire regular season. Agree. Uh, and, you know, Westbrook is making passes we haven't seen him make. Uh, Durant, Durant is finding guys, and all of a sudden, all these role players who are just sitting around, uh, kind of hanging out, waiting for the ball to come off the rim to get it. And it. Now they have something to do on offense, and and you have to guard five guys instead of three, and it's and it's become really tough. And then yeah. they're forced so many San Antonio turnovers, which they never did in the regular season, and San Antonio never turned the ball over, uh, which which is really bizarre. And they're playing the right guys, the right minutes now. Like in game two, they played Derek Fisher 26 minutes, which just should never happen ever. Yeah. <laughs> just shouldn't. Uh, I thought Brooks just didn't do a great job. I know they're playing better, but it, it's pretty clear who their best guys are. And what, and I'm surprised. The thing that's amazed me is that they've had so much success in, in four and five with, uh, Abaka and Perkins playing together because to me, I thought that was the Spurs' best chance to win if those two guys played together. And after the first two games, that's what it seemed like. And that's the part I don't understand about this series. How has that changed? How how all of a sudden has that become a terrible matchup for San Antonio when that was the matchup they wanted? I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it it makes no sense. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you, you know, it's funny you talk about Brooks. I think this series has really shown how much progress he's made as a coach because. Agreed. Uh, you know, even a year ago, you'd watch his team and kind of think, are they, are they, are they running any plays? What are they trying to do here? And, and there just wasn't a lot of creativity in their sets and stuff. And I think he tried to keep it simple because they were so young. Uh, but he's, he's put in some clever stuff and not just in this series against LA too. And, and defensively, he's done some stuff too that has really kind of thrown opponents off. And, uh, he's, he's just, he's, you know, coaches improve is one of the things you, you know, the people forget. Uh, yeah, and, it, and an underrated an underrated thing he did was, it's not like he gave the car keys to James Harden, but he let it be known that it was okay if James Harden grabbed the car keys every once in a while, you know, and that, get out of the way, Russell, you're, you don't have to play point guard all the time, let, let James run it, he's got a good matchup here, James is going to go to the rim, and I don't, you know, I thought that Dallas game, I thought game four was the most important game that's happened to them, again, in the Dallas series, because... Um, it was just it, it just wasn't their night they were gonna lose. And then the Harden thing took over and it was kinda like the big light bulb went off um and flickered over that whole team. And then the second big game, um, game four, fourth quarter, San Antonio, yep. when it just was clear Durant was their guy and I, I don't wanna overanalyze it, but man, it seemed like Westbrook finally realized it in that game, or am I imagining that? No, I'd agree. I mean, we've we've seen Durant do that before, but I don't, I, I, not to the extent where they had one thing working and they just went to it and went to it and just hammered them with it every time. And there was never, there was never an intermission where Russell said, "Well, I'm going to pull up from 20 now." And right. uh, to that extent, I think you're right. The interesting stat about Harden, I don't know if you've seen this, 
in the last three minutes of games within five points, he did not have a field goal the entire season. Wow. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. You know, the other thing, I, even when I was writing the Game 2 Retro Diary and kind of extolling the virtue of the Spurs, I was saying, like, yeah, there are not any major flaws here. The only one I can see, and the one that I'm sure the Spurs fans are thinking about a little bit, is they are relying on Danny Green and Gary Neal and Kawhi Leonard and Steven Jackson. Like, they do need these guys to play well to win. Like, that, that is part of what's happening here, and those guys have been playing great. They've been lights out. Danny Green went south in the series. Like, he just he exited staged right in Game 3, and, and I think he only played six minutes in Game 5. Yeah, and um, Bonner, too. Bonner's been out. He just done nothing. Jackson, they really leaned on almost a little too heavily at this point in his career in Game Five. Uh, mm-hmm. Leonard had an excellent game. F- I think he had an excellent Game Four. Um, but man, he's still a rookie. You can't trust rookies. You know, even like when Rondo was a second year guy uh, on the 08 Celtics, I never totally felt like we could trust him. Like he's a young guy. You yeah. just don't know what you're gonna get from that tonight. Um, so having those guys kind of collectively crumble a little bit on top of what's happened with Parker maybe that's explainable I think right yeah and you know what though even though you look through the series and even with those guys struggling San Antonio scored at a perfectly decent clip yeah it's really they they just can't guard the thunder right now right well you know I, I look at game four and it's like San Antonio came out that game they're ready to play Kerr even said it. He's like, this is going to be a great game. These two, Both of these teams are locked in. This is going to be awesome. And uh, Ibaka and Perkins go 18 for 20. Like House and I were talking about this on the podcast the other day. It's probably not going to happen again in our lifetime. You know, it was it was fluky. And sometimes you need a fluky event to turn the series. Then Durant takes over at the end. Maybe that was the game that San Antonio was destined to win and they can't. I still am, you know, the games tonight, we're taping this on a Wednesday. I would not be, I, I wouldn't be even remotely shocked if San Antonio won tonight. I'd be more surprised if Miami won than if San Antonio won. I wouldn't be surprised if either team won. But I think San Antonio um, has a better chance of winning, even if Vegas doesn't agree. What do you think? Uh, I was I was torn. I was thinking about this today. I was like, because I was thinking to myself, one of these series is going to turn again, and I wish I knew which one. Right. Uh, I I agree with you. I wouldn't be surprised to see San Antonio win. I wouldn't be that surprised if Miami won either, though. Well, yeah, yeah. Obviously, as a Celtics fan, <laughs> I have I have to admit that I'm not surprised for all jinxy purposes. The I also wouldn't be surprised if San Antonio won Game Six and then Oklahoma City won Game Seven. I'm not sure if home court matters in this series. I, I think it probably matters a little more to Oklahoma City, but I think either team could go into either building and win. I'm not sure that if the Celtics crowd shows up and the Celtics are playing, you know, at a really high level, I think it would be tough for this particular Miami team to win unless LeBron just went crazy, you know. No, Had, I mean, they were a shot for winning in game four, right? Did you feel like we played well in that game, though? We played well for a half. Then we, then we, that was a rollover in the second half by us. Like I'm saying, was, like if, yeah. if the Celtics played well, I, I feel like Oklahoma City could play well tonight, and San mm-hmm. Antonio could just do the thing where they just are out of their mind, you know. And I, I still don't understand what happened to Parker in this series, because that was a guy who everybody agreed was playing at a level of one of the top five players in the league. Yeah, and, and they, when they changed up how they were defending him, they San Antonio still hasn't figured that out um it's and they've they've just made it so difficult for him and it's it's really weird because you you have to think he's seen switching defenses before like i don't don't understand what the problem is but it's and and taking him out is taking all those like easy kickouts to the corner away too that they usually feast on with their role players right um out of these four remaining teams forget about um predictions for tonight who do you think has the best chance to win the NBA title? Uh, I think you'd have to say Oklahoma City right now. They're one game away from advancing the home court in the finals uh, against either opponent, and uh, it just feels like it's their time. Yeah, it's it really does feel a little 91 Bulls-ish. It does. Like In the 91 Bulls thing, as it was happening, it was like, oh, yeah, this is happening, but they're still young. It's not quite their time yet, and then they just kept winning. 
you know, and they swept the Pistons. They lose game one to the Lakers on the Perkins three. And I was like, yeah, see, see, they weren't ready. Magic and the old guys are going to take it. And then they just went to that second gear and they won the next four games. And it just became clear at some point in that series. All right, the young guys, it's their time. And I'm with you. It, it, it did seem like in game four in the fourth quarter, we might have hit that point. But I still want to see them clinch. I, wouldn't, I certainly yeah, wouldn't bet my life on them winning tonight. The one thing that I wonder about with them, uh, virtually every team en route to becoming a champion, uh, even even when it's a team like the 08 Celtics where they came in together and won right away, the, the guys had experienced this individually. Some awful, crushing, heartbreaking failure first. Uh, and mm. Oklahoma hasn't really had that. I mean, they'd say last year against Dallas, but I, I don't think they were really – ready for that one yet anyway um yeah the Oklahoma so that's City the only fan. thing i wonder about with them is as if as if they need that moment first their fans would say that blowing that dallas game at home when their offense just fell apart and durant was like 30 feet from the basket and couldn't even get the ball I mean, that was pretty traumatic you could argue that that was the game you you, you could argue that you could argue but I don't, I don't know if they walked away from that series going, we should have won that. True. They were like, we weren't quite ready to win that, but we had a chance, and then Dirk went to another level, and we couldn't match it. But now I feel like... We're, we're in Dallas, match. you know, had the more typical history of a few examples where they were really were thinking, wow, we should have won that. We blew that. Yeah, 87 Pistons. I think even... The Shaq, Kobe, Laker teams, like, uh, you know, to, had a little adversity there in 97, 98, 99. You do need to get punched in the chin a couple of times. Hollander, yeah. you're doing great work on ESPN.com. I'm trying to actually trade for you. I'm, Rob King and I have had a lot of trade discussions. Um, <laughs> it's really very – so if you see your name in the papers, um, don't get alarmed. Just keep doing what you're doing. But uh, can, it, can it be one of those NASCAR things where I like I, I do the Grantland series on Saturday and then the and then the ESPN on Sunday or something? Yeah, we don't want to share you. We just want you. We we've stockpiled <laughs> we've stockpiled a lot of number one picks. We have some some cap figure space. We're looking good. So he, you might be hearing from us a little more often. But keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in the finals. All right. Sounds great. All right, thanks. thanks. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.